Okay, so we begin. Uh, international regulation of stable coins. Uh, just briefly, I know a lot of people, many people just saw my t-shirt, so I will uh, now deny I never worked for Lehman Brothers. Uh, I work uh, for the French government, uh, the administration. Um, I am uh, at the cyber center of the gendarmerie, uh, covering uh, financial or not financial, but cyber crimes. And uh, right before, I was uh, at the tax investigation directorate in France, where I uh, taught uh, about blockchains and crypto since uh, 2016 uh, for people who don't like it at all. So now that it is said, and I am the most popular with the tax uh, stuff, uh, I will let you introduce you. And um, first question for all of you. Um, what was your first experience with the stable coins? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. So my name is Pierre. Um, I'm a former MP uh, of the French Parliament. So I discovered crypto in 2014, and I discovered blockchain when I was MP uh, in 2018, uh, at the start of uh, of Tether and and, and Circle. And uh, yeah, quickly I managed to create the first legal framework about crypto in Europe, uh, in France in 2018, 2019, in order to attract capitals and, and company in France and innovate on, uh, on blockchain. Nice. Uh, thank you. I'm Lior from uh, Israel. I'm the legal counsel of uh, State Capital a Group uh, with all the initiatives around. And uh, I started uh, with uh, crypto in 2010. I was a white collar criminal, criminal white collar lawyer, then discovered Bitcoin, then wrote my master thesis. Then it was uh, one of the first studies on uh, Bitcoin, theories of money. Since then, I, was, uh, I shifted to the field. I was uh, you know, one of the activists, uh, worked with a lot of projects uh, in the beginning from colored coins till many others that uh, were in the space during the ICOs. After that, worked with banks to on in Germany, more, mostly in Germany, on implementation of uh, blockchain projects, and uh, then in state capital, also writing uh, articles, PhD on DAOs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and uh, for uh, stable coins. Uh, actually, I met Bru uh, Brooke Pierce, and, uh, <laughs> and that was a uh, very early pitch, the idea of uh, stable coins, and then just used it from, from uh, the time they uh, were with us. All right, hi, I'm Peter. Um, actually, actually uh, by the way, I, I have to apologize. My voice isn't that good, so take care or beware of uh, computer viruses and also kindergarten viruses, I can, I can just say. Um, so I'm originally a developer who these days is reading more law text than code, I would say, because uh, over time I uh, traveled like, um, into founding several companies and um, since eight years uh, I'm in the fintech space, so um, first uh, co-founded Solaris Bank as a, as a CTO, which was the first um, fintech startup in Germany that uh, actually got a banking license. In 2017, I also, in, um, when, I, when I got into the crypto space, I, I tried to move them into the crypto space as well, because um, also back then, uh, banks, um, that, like, or especially crypto friends, banks uh, have been needed like everywhere especially to to get the fiat money into the system um, you can use stable coins but you can of course also use crypto friendly banks and um, I think in the end we we managed to make Solaris Bank crypto friendly but I wanted to work full-time in crypto help to build up a, a, like a data company for a stock exchange which was um, the first regulated crypto MTF in, in Germany um, under under BaFin regulation and uh, two years ago we founded Unstoppable um, Finance um, and with our product Ultimate and we want to bring DeFi to the masses um, and to, to bring DeFi to the masses we started with Ultimate with a non-custodial wallet which is really easy to use but um, so we have to do more so we announced um, a few weeks back that uh, we're going to found um, Europe's first DeFi bank um, and uh, in the end, we will also issue a stable coin, uh, but we want to do this from, from a full bank. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Jacek, and you know, my story of stable coins dates back to 1997. I got my first PC from my parents, 
uh, but I'm just kidding, of course. Um, in 2016, um, I was part of like a small startup that wanted to do a stablecoin uh, with a guy from Goldman Sachs and another one who later became a, a CTO at uh, Trufi, uh, but it didn't happen. Later on, shortly thereafter, in 2017, I joined MakerDAO as the first general counsel and spent a few years um, at that project um, and you know, spent a lot of time with global regulators back at the time when Maker was the only DeFi project out there. Um, and later, I was a little bit tired with stablecoins, so I left to, to, to go to Harvard Law School for a year. Uh, but after I came back, I um, co-founded a company that is uh, called L2Beat. It has nothing to do with stablecoins. But I guess I couldn't help myself because I also became um, an advisor at Gyroscope, um, which is a stablecoin stable project that presented yesterday. And also, I really wanted to come here to see what's going on in the stablecoin space. Okay, thank you. Um, the first question will be um, on... Uh, the, the framework we have uh, will have in in, uh, in Europe uh, because we know we have to deal with uh, um, international compliance and FATF rules the new OECD uh, crypto asset regulation framework uh, which I also uh, contributed to 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 build uh, with the, the Ministry of Economy in France uh, so we have a lot of new rules and we have separate uh, uh, frameworks in different countries or continent and we talk a lot about uh, Mika uh, we have uh, the opportunity uh, today to have uh, a Pierre uh, with us uh, which uh, help creating uh, the the French legal framework in 2018 2019 uh, can you uh, tell us how uh, Mika uh, framework will change thing uh, for stable coins uh, especially uh, when we talk about EMT, electronic money tokens, and ART, uh, asset reference tokens. Yes, absolutely. So, for the moment, all over the world, uh, there is no clear path and regulation for stablecoin. Um, and since, um, since the start of the work of uh, EU Commission in 2020, uh, we managed to create uh, a regulative framework about uh, stablecoin that will extend the notion of electronic money uh, for stablecoin. So uh, in the text, uh, there will be uh, two uh, different type of stablecoin. Uh, the first, like you said, is a EMT, so electronic money token. Uh, it's a token which is backed directly by fiat. So you will apply directly the, the uh, notion of electronic money, uh, which was created in, 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 um, in, yeah, in 2029, uh, 20, and there is different text. But Really, the idea is that your stablecoin will be directly backed by fiat and you will have the funds segregated in, in a bank account and you will have a strict uh, uh, prudential policy on the asset. So you will not be able to do what you want uh, with, uh, with the uh, asset behind the, the stablecoin. The um, second type of uh, stablecoin is uh, characterized by different type of assets, so mainly securities, commodities, uh, and, and so on. And the idea is to have a, a stablecoin which is not directly linked to uh, to fiat, uh, and so uh, they they share some um, some aspect uh, in terms of regulation about uh, capitals, about segregation, about uh, uh, prudential policy, uh, but the collateral is not the same. So it's why um, EU Commission, EU Parliament uh, strictly uh, separate uh, these two notions uh, and in order to create two different setups uh, for protecting uh, assets uh, and the collateral behind the stablecoin for, for investors. Any reaction or because it will basically like be like PayPal, you know, it's electronic money. So PayPal is electronic money. What's, what's the change? What's the difference? Well, I, I would also um, change, uh, start yeah. like with uh, with Mika like from from another angle because um, I think when it was introduced or when the conversation started, it was like a Lex Libra. Yeah, so there was Facebook with um, with the stablecoin idea and. Um, even like not being the biggest fan of Facebook, I must really say, so when I read the white paper and looked into the technology and so on and uh, talked to a few people, I really thought like, whoa, Facebook is doing this really, really good. So like really broad uh, kind of um, set of 
companies and partners and uh, kind of like really trying to make this as decentralized as possible and not own, not owned by Facebook but kind of like owned by uh, by really a big community and um, then the reaction of the European Union was like oh no so we don't want to lose the control over our monetary system because if a company like Facebook comes around the corner with 2 billion plus um, users around the globe so this is very likely to become the like the main money rail um, and that's what we don't want and that's kind of where my criticism would already start because in the end regulation has always been something something proactive yeah so that's at least how i learned it for myself from being a developer so why is regulation there so i thought okay there's some misbehaviors on the market where some people or politicians or, or parties think okay so we need to jump in and we need to regulate whatever um, front running on on exchanges has been a problem because it's some so, some sort of fraud, like in the traditional markets, um, like in the 80s. Okay, so there has been some reaction. In the, the regulation was introduced, and uh, in the end, um, kind of all the all the markets need to apply to this. And uh, and so this is the origin of Mika. So where I still think like, okay, wait, there there wasn't really a problem. So kind of like of um, uh, markets uh, defects and so on, but still this uh, this regulation came. Fast forwarding a little bit, um, I think the, the Mika is not only about uh, like stable coins. There's also other parts. So it's also about um, regulating and harmonizing uh, centralized offered crypto services. And I think um, in the meanwhile, the, uh, the tonality when talking about Mika changed a bit because um, we've seen Celsius crashing, we've seen FTX crashing, and all the centralized models crashing. So um, in the end, Mika is like a reaction, like a counter reaction to it. So for, I think when we're talking about centralized services, it's a good idea. But um, yeah, so I, I still want to raise that uh, that finger kind of um, so we should introduce regulation if we if there's really misbehavior on the markets and that was not the case here. But you were talking about the goals. Uh, what does uh, regulation stand for uh, to correct uh, the bad effects and to implement policies and, and so on, but the the means and the tools uh, are legal concepts. So I have another question. <laughs> uh, for legal legal concepts, do you think, uh, Jacek, do you think um, the traditional concept we, we all know, uh, the territory, uh, the legal personality and so on as we, we see uh, with the DAO, uh, do you think they really can apply to cryptocurrencies in general and stable coins in particular? Or we have to invent something different? Uh, I, I guess it would take me like two hours to answer that question, but I'll try you have to two be minutes. Really quick. <laughs> yes, I know. So first of all, I fully agree with Peter. I mean, Mika is like full of um, like good ways to solve real problems. I mean, the fact that we don't have regulation of centralized exchanges or market manipulation is just a joke. And uh, Mika is going to finally uh, fix it, uh, at least in the EU. So that's great. For the stablecoin part, Totally agree. This is a political reaction to a problem that has not even existed, and its implementation is also poor, so we're going to get to it. Now, in terms of like the legal concepts, it's like, you know, before we get to the legal concepts, we let's start with the economic ones. There is this super old um, concept by Ronald Coase um, of the nature, author of the nature of the firm. It is eight years old, and he provided a, a very good insight about what is a firm. He said, a firm is a nex nexus of contracts that is like combined together to reduce transaction costs of just interacting with free actors on, in the market. So people come together to not be forced to like contract arm's length with every other person to reduce transaction costs. Now, it absolutely makes sense, right? And the legal concepts are built around this concept, right? If there is this like tight group of like interests and contrast, this is where the legal personality came from. But in the context of new technologies and including blockchain smart contracts, look, smart contracts reduce um, the transaction costs, right? You don't have to worry about transaction costs of like someone behaving uh, in a bad way if you have a self-enforcing smart contract that is just going to behave as expected. Um, so that's why uh, suddenly in the concept of in the in the context of crypto you have like the concept of of firm kind of like falling apart right because you don't need those firms because people can deal with transaction costs in different ways 
Um, now, in the concept of in the context of stablecoins, that means, for example, that you don't have a single issuer, right? Because you have stablecoin functions, like usually like money functions, separated from each other, and you can have a stablecoin project, and you have many of them, including decentralized ones like Maker, in which you don't have like all of the features of a stablecoin project in one person, in one legal person. You have or in one country. Exactly. You're right. It can just live on Ethereum, and then you can have like ex exactly no issuer, and then those functions distributed in different ways. And this is something that the regulation does not solve, right? Because there is this private, legal, private law part to it, whether to treat it as a legal person or not. But let's leave it aside. This is the two-hour two part. But then there is a regulatory perspective, how to license this thing. And how regulation works is exactly to license this specific entities, and it's not the case, especially for decentralized projects and decentralized stablecoins. You have those functions split uh, in different ways. Um, so this is, uh, this is my <laughs> short answer to that. Uh, but also in the context of Mika, this is where Mika fails, right? Because it doesn't recognize its real reality. It just regulates single issuer. And of course, it does work for some players on the market. It doesn't work for many other players, especially those innovative ones. Also, if I may add, stablecoin is, uh, as usual, it's a term. It's a term. It's like tokens. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a diverse. So you have already different kinds of uh, stablecoins. If you try to classify them, I would say it's an asset-baked, whether it's a, it's a, a fiat or, or other, uh, other asset. It's uh, on-chain uh, collateralized, like uh, DAI, and it's uh, non-collateralized, like uh, Ter uh, Terra Luna. And, um, but you have many kinds, and you have, beside of the many kinds and the functions that the stable, co stable coins could, uh, could uh, show, there is also the, the, the people that behind it that carries, uh, or the entities, people, entities, slash many kinds of uh, things that can carry the liability or the the uh, responsibility for this project so it's a uh, it's open uh, you know stable coins are really diverse and when mika mika actually is a reflection of the market so it's a reflection you know the the regulator were not uh, i i think didn't sit and think what would be the next innovative or what is the best. No, we have this and this. Those are the characteristics and we need to cover them, wrap them. So that's how regulation is, uh, is coming to, 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 to us. I I'm totally agree with, um, with this approach. I think um, we start uh, the EU Commission start to build Mika on a defensive approach, uh, really against Libra. And all the French politician and, and European politician wake up and say, okay, there is a lack of serenity, we will have a problem. If uh, uh, United States, if on USD or maybe on another uh, basket, uh, there is a, a, a private money, private money in the sense that uh, the issuer is private. But really, um, I think the, the, the main, not problem, because it, it's, a, it's a debate, you know, it's a very uh, a political subject in uh, the beauty of the term. Um, there is two axes. The first axis is uh, the competition between all currency in terms of euro, dollar, what is the aim of uh, each currency against each other, and what is uh, the strength of, uh, of dollar behind euro, and so on. And there is a, a second axis between uh, we, who is the issuer? Uh, is it a private issuer? Or is it a public issuer? And, and for this debate, we don't have the, the solution yet. So there is CBDC and so on, but there is a big fight against traditional actors that doesn't want to, to, be, to see a new paradigm of uh, issuance uh, in terms of monetary, because CBDC um, is not a welcome for a traditional bank. Um, and um, there is... Um, what will be the new standard of money? And I think the, the, the greatest question about stablecoin is what is the collateral? Uh, is it directly by fiat? And if it's fiat, it's directly ECB, you know, because the ratio will be the ECB one and, and so on. Is it uh, treasury bills? And treasury bills is debt from states. So it's not directly uh, uh, ECB uh, ratio, but it's like an indirect central money. Or is it anything else? be Bitcoin, and so on. So I think this uh, political question has to be seen as less than what is the issuer? Is it decentralized? 
Is it public one? Is it a private one? But m mostly, what is the collateral? Is it FinHair, like ECB, they print uh, money uh, each time they want in, to, in order to, uh, to build their uh, budgetary policy, the budget policy? Or is it uh, many, many other assets that can create a, 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 another type of money? So good practices is, and reserves and so on. Sure. But then when you have, sorry, when you have the Mika, then you have the big starting point of, uh, of a debate. You have the starting point of a debate. So if I am an alien that is coming with my own product, I can have something to relate to. And then I can start to initiate and to create the, the framework that I need. Um, also picking up from, from your points, because um, um, Mika is about centralized companies. So, so that's, that's, that's how it was designed and uh, how it's, uh, it's also now going to be interpreted. And when it comes to e-money, kind of tokenizing e-money and um, make it, or enabling the euro to be sent around the globe like in real time. It's like putting two rockets on, on the euro and you can send it around the globe. I think that's, that was a very easy regulation because e-money is already there. We learned from the, from the previous talk. And um, in the end, with e-money, there's an issuer. You can kind of tokenize the e-money. There's this uh, blockchain infrastructure. I think that, I think that, that really worked out in... I think in, 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 in a good way, I would say, because um, from, from my core belief, so maybe some of you also follow the discussions around the digital euro. And I think like the digital euro, how it's currently planned, it's like a complete disaster from my point of view. So like expecting, so if we really want it to be the best for our citizens, so that the taxes uh, kind of being spent to build it and to kind of uh, to launch it, I think it's it's a pure nightmare, and uh, and I really believe that with uh, even with Mika regulation and having like stricter rules on on e money than we had until until now, I think it's still still a good step forward because I think um, we can, we the community can build with Mika the the real digital euro from my point of view. It can be it's permissionless. It can live on public blockchains. It's open kind of to build DeFi around it um, and um, make it programmable. And uh, it's uh, it's available for everyone. So I think that's uh, that's a uh, that's a good good step in between to make the euro more digital. So when it comes to the arts, to the asset reference tokens, I, st I still think the and also this is also some of the criticisms criticism from the from the regulators community that the regulation is too strict. So it almost feels like like e money token is halfway easy to to achieve, but as a asset reference token is almost impossible. And um, and I'm also again looking at this from from a citizen's perspective, I'm a little bit sad because um, let's think really twenty years, forty years, eighty years in the future so do we believe that the euro is the most stable currency up until then? Yeah, I and we're, we're we're making debt like unlimitedly. We uh, need to finance wars. There's like the climate crisis and so on. And we all know like debt is is kind of poison for the for the finance system. And and maybe um, the citizens' money in the future need to evolve from first it's euro bound like with an e-money token. That's great. But maybe in 20 years or 30 years, we need to have an asset reference token. So where you have like a basket of euro and some other more stable currency in there because um, kind of the citizens want to, to keep their money. And I think that's um, what I'm a little bit sad about because kind of this t technological innovation is now somehow killed by, by the regulation. That's the, the point I wanted to, to make and to ask uh, for all of you. Uh, the last question will be on power and control because there is a paradox uh, which apply to all cryptocurrencies and the whole uh, distributed ledger uh, technology sector in general, but particularly uh, on stable coins is as a civil servant for the French government uh, and as uh, a Linux user from 20 years ago, I have two voices in my head. The first voice uh, is from blockchain forensics uh, company, such as Chainalysis or Elliptic or others, saying, well, we did the math, and there is one, two percent uh, of the volume of the transaction with uh, criminal activities, with the links between the public uh, addresses. And uh, from the other side, uh, we have the um, BIS, uh, reports, Fed, uh, FCA, 
FinCEN, <laughs> all the authorities uh, saying that uh, we need to regulate cryptocurrencies, but especially stable coins uh, represent a threat to the financial stability. But why does it represent a threat to financial stability? Because it, it's a bridge between the cryptocurrencies uh, sector and the traditional uh, centralized finance where there is the liquidity and the interoperability. And what I, what I want to say is um, if the policies and the regulation uh, which is made at international level is set to protect us from criminal activities that represent 1%, and if on the other side <laughs> we have a switch from centralized network to decentralized network, can we just <laughs> cut the crap <laughs> and say the world? It's just about the power and the control. So to be uh, like brutal, I would say, if you think there is room in the future for um, uh, stable coins and CBDC, if you don't think there will only be CBDC, do you think stable coins developer or lawyers are ready to be like a subsidiary of the central bank? Leo? I, I would take it maybe a bit uh, to the theoretical side. So uh, <clears throat> according to the legal theory, actually anarchism is bad. Because in anarchism, uh, people are eating each other, and then, uh, you know, we created rules, so the whole judicial system in every country is shaped in order to to prevent us from killing each other, okay? And th that's those are the laws, because, uh, you know, I create law that is preventing you from murder, and uh, then you can, of course, justify it from an economic perspective or value perspective, but basically the theory is that... Uh, you know, the Leviathan of Hobbes, and the theory is that we can function only if we have a, a, a king. The or state is here root. to protect us. Yeah. It's, it's state, for your and protection. That's, and that's a solution, yeah. But, but guess how? Guess what? Actually, the, we have cryptocurrencies, and from the beginning, Bitcoin was something that the governments could not control. So Bitcoin was there, deal with it, use it, deal with it, do whatever you want. But then uh, it's an open, uh, it's an alien, it's an alien. And then this alien, technological alien, you need to, there was always the question when I wrote my thesis, every day I came to the university and I, they asked me, no, uh, so how many people are using Bitcoin? How many people? So Amazon is accepting payments. Uh, this one is accepting payments, you know, with 2011, 12. And, um, and then, uh, they try to find evidences in the usage, but but then yes, the usage people could use Bitcoin, and then it became a social convention, and then who cares what the government wants or don't want if you have these super decentralized products that no one can can uh, stop. So then Bitcoin depends on us. Uh, specific DAOs maybe, but you know depends on the decentralization level. And then, of course, the industry started to build companies and entities, etc., etc., etc. When you have an entity, you are in a, in the field of the government, so you can the government can come and blame you, and you can uh, claim against the government. And then uh, the question of stable coins. Stable coins are are uh, created by people by entities as as a as a comp maybe competition, maybe not. To the to the uh, to the national money, or to uh, other financial products. I, I have a la last question, very last, but just to be uh, concise. I didn't uh, tell uh, my reaction when I stumbled the first time on stablecoin. The first time I said, "What the fuck?" But I don't need what what I, I just go into cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and Ethereum to escape fiat currencies, and I have the digital dollar or digital representation of Euro, doesn't work, there is no, so if you saw the movie Inception, stable coins are basically a digital representation of a digital representation, which is fiat, of gold, 
silver, and so on in the median age. So th it's, it's not uh, a feature of cryptocurrency, it's a bug. It exists, it only exists because people cannot use, for now, cryptocurrencies directly in the retail to buy stuff, to buy water, or to sell contracts. They have to go across the most, the, the first pair trading uh, in the whole industry is USDT and BTC. So it's like a failure for the cryptocurrency industry in my point of view, that's just finished. <laughs> Actually, I, I would like to respond also to your previous question and also to this okay. one, um, because I like starting with the last one, um, I would slightly disagree because, um, from my point of view, stablecoin is not tokenized fiat or like digital fiat. So it's it's something different because also if you look at all the kind of like reports of of Circle kind of showing how they invest the money and so on, it's way way lower risk than than the fiat system. And um, and in the end, because you, because the I agree with this <laughs> the, because because they kind of the companies try to hold it like in very sh kind of like short duration papers and and so on, so like as riskless as possible. And even the e money institutes are kind of claiming to get a central bank account uh, these days because this is like the the lowest risk possible. And um, and therefore, so I think so because just just to put that clear that um, it's not like another digital layer around fiat. It's I would say something in parallel. But to the to the previous question, because um, you were referring to uh, like the anti-money laundering and kind of like one percent of the transactions being uh, correlated with uh, with crime. Um, so I agree to that part of the of the question that uh, this somehow like especially when being in the crypto industry somehow feels bad, like because um, it's much more transparent. It's uh, like all the prosecutors, at least that I met on conferences and so on, they're always saying like, please don't take away Bitcoin because um, we have to follow the money all day and um, and it, it, it made our life easier. Um, so, so therefore it, it feels somehow somehow bad when, when all these, uh, these rules get in introduced. Um, but we need to be clear that Mika is not about AML. Yeah, so Mika Mika doesn't doesn't contain kind of new new rules for for AML. So therefore, with with Mika, there's there's no you know, new rules introduced. Or FATF and yeah, so so there there's like other regulations uh, coming up, kind okay. of like the AM, the new AMLR, uh, the TFR that also uh, has become Father active, rule. kind of yeah. in parallel with with the Mika. Um, and um, and also all these uh, even like the, the new AMLR is still relatively open to to decentralized um, networks and I think that's also what I really want to put out as a message here that we really need to fight for keeping things as decentralized as possible because there could also be an interpretation of e-money to make it closed loop so which would mean performing transactions that's the, like, like that's PayPal. the idea of of having so, a license. Yeah, so because at the, because at the moment because at the moment, um, for example, USDC is an open loop stablecoin, open loop e money. So you can send it to somebody else who's not KYC with, with Circle, and then kind of it travels back, and then it can kind of get paid into into fiat again. And I think um, so that's super important for the crypto industry to keep it open loop um, for the for the future. Because um, so also when whatever like. Uh, also putting it in, in, a, in a broader perspective, I think the, the innovation that we have with, with stable coins is that we, for the first time, can have an internet of money. So which means, so far we can send euro until like the borders of Europe with SEPA and then we need to use SWIFT and money conversion and so on, correspondence bank system. So not like the internet, which was like a, like a global information system, we don't have a global money system right now. And I think if we, can come up with stable coins, keep it open, keep it uh, open source with the technology that we use and uh, make it accessible. I think we really can introduce the internet of money which never existed. Okay. Uh, short, shortly we will take question after that. Yeah, just to react to what you said about like the possibility of stable coins becoming a subset of CBDCs. Just two practical points. The first one is that, I mean, it's not only this room where people are skeptical about CBDCs. Um, I mean, this is becoming mine, one of the main topics in the presidential campaign in the US right now. Like literally some of the candidates are calling for the ban on CBDCs. So like a huge de like de um, um, debate about um, you know, democracy and legitimacy is gonna to is gonna start. Of course, we don't feel it in Europe, right? Because this is happening at not at the national level, but it's gonna happen. And second, look for Mika. 
MECA proposal was made in September 2020. It took three years until it was adopted and it will not gonna enter, like practically, it's not gonna be applicable uh, on over the next year, right? So it's four years. Like how long do you think it's gonna take for digital euro? Is it gonna take less? For me, the guess is at least five years, right? So it, it means that we have like at least five years and come on, 2028, it's gonna, I mean, we are gonna just rock the world with all the stable coins that are gonna come out of this room. I'm sure about it. If uh, we'll, does we'll not probably have a, a war with China and Russia, so we won't be able to talk about CBDC, so everything gonna be fine. Uh, we will take a few questions. There, uh, you said you're a member of parliament here in France. So my question is, obviously you're advanced thinking, but what percentage of people in parliament actually not only gets this, want to get it, or uses this as somebody will give them a bribe, like in the US, to vote no on something because they want to do a farm bill? Like, what is the politics of this, you know? What percentage of the people actually even understand it? Close to zero? No, uh, I think few, few people, few people. Really, uh, I was lonely uh, because I'm, I'm a former MP, so uh, uh, yeah, I, I try my best to convince my colleagues to educate, and I think education is, is very important. You know, there is good regulation and bad regulation. Good regulation is to protect people, and I think it's not a, a bad world. We need to protect people. We have seen with our industry, that we need more protection. And really, actual, nowadays, we need always more protection because I'm not totally sure that uh, USDC or USDT uh, protects people uh, more than fiat, really. Uh, we don't have seen that with SVB and, and so on. The second part there is bad regulation. And bad regulation is because uh, regulation will protect the insiders, so people which are in the game right now, so banks. And for that, banks are very powerful. Uh, EU Commission, EU Parliament uh, have a lot of information from banks, but just one point of view. Um, Binance, Coinbase, chain analysis, so we are totally absent of this debate. And really the education of uh, my, my former colleagues uh, are very important to explain what is crypto, what is blockchain, not just to, uh, to, to see what is uh, written in newspaper. Uh, about, yeah, like you said, uh, anti-money, modern laundering, and, and terrorism, and so on. So really, um, this is uh, the duty for, for the crypto community to uh, engage a fight in order to educate people, uh, people like uh, our parents, but people like uh, this public decisors. And this is very important because if we don't do that, uh, the, democrat the democratization of crypto will be very hard. And since what we have seen with FTX and so on, we, we can see that retails are far away from us. So really, we need to, to, to build, but we need to educate to uh, all the politics, because it's not only the, the fault of politics. I think we, we need to, to do better. Um, and maybe um, one way to turn the narrative on, on this point is kind of uh, we can explain to the politicians that it's a huge opportunity to make the euro more relevant in the world, right? Because uh, suddenly we, you can send it around the globe and other people can use it. Of course, they need to be able to use it in whatever country they, 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 they receive it. But then there might be countries or people who use the euro to really have like a safe asset um, in their wallet because their, their home currency is, is not as stable. So um, in the end, I think um, the politicians more or less by strategically um, came to this uh, to this regulation and it's in the end a huge opportunity and I think we need to educate them that they have this opportunity right now. Just, just adding one thing, the parliament is uh, the front but you have the back office of the administration, the, the high administration makes the law and then you have Pierre and his colleague just signing what has been done in the high just, administration. Just but yeah, yeah the power of the administration is very... So the real, the real long-term uh, uh, stuff to do is my job inside the administration. And it's much, much, much harder than the whips and uh, dealing with the lobby and, and so on. Uh, last question, sorry, we only have uh, time for another question. Yeah. Hey, hello. Um, AML was mentioned because Mika is obviously not covering AML aspects and I was wondering uh, to foster adoption, what are the chances that the debate will shift from 
let's impose AML requirements on crypto to how to find an innovative way of handling AML because obviously it's all burdensome, costly, and it will not work with crypto. So if we just extend AML, it will not be very fruitful, right? Just to clarify, maybe on-chain regulation? It could be, like all these solutions like Polygon Kill ID. Switch? <laughs> But yeah, just one wall, very quick, uh, zero knowledge proof. Uh, it will be the future of uh, uh, KYC. I think we need some risk approach, but not the actual one. And zero knowledge is a protection for privacy in blockchain. And I guess it's also a matter of uh, values and, uh, and um, again, education and writing. Because <clears throat> whatever technological solution that you will have, you need a support. You need a theoretical support for it. It needs to. It needs a theory behind it. It needs articles and it needs uh, uh, advocates that will support this, and then uh, it will be a combination of those uh, those two things, I guess. And uh, yeah, I think in the end we have to distinguish kind of the centralized and the decentralized concepts. Like for the centralized, it's it's relatively easy. You can do this like it, as in the bank, but for the decentralized, it's super complicated because AML and control and intermediaries can really kill the whole concept of being decentralized, right? And uh, so I agree. Also, kind of um, so I I believe. Um, kind of like in, in, in AML, so you have this term of an uh, obliged person. Yeah, so for example, like a, like a bank is an obliged person, so they have to apply all the, all the laws like for, for, for AML. Um, and, and they're kind of like the counterparty for whatever state and uh, prosecution and so on. And um, from my point of view, like in a decentralized world, also us individuals, like being self-sovereign, like with a self-sovereign identity living with our wallet, can become an obliged person ourselves. Yeah, so kind of like being responsible for kind of like uh, whatever, uh, following whatever rules we want to follow and kind of making sure that we don't do criminal transactions or whatever. So because if we do, we might get found somewhere and then we need to take the, the, um, the consequences for that. But I think, so I think the individual needs to become more self-sovereign um, also in terms of like uh, applying to the, to the rules. And I think that that would be the way kind of in, in including uh, kind of uh, like a digital identity with zero knowledge proofs um, to really um, achieve that. Yes, um, I would just add to that. I, obviously, AML is one of the key topics here. Uh, perhaps even more important than the mere regulation of stable coins. I just want to, to say that we should appreciate what we have now because the fact that we can send and receive stable coins around uh, without KYC is not a given. Um, it's actually, I think that we are quite lucky that this is the case. Um, uh, I think I, I see like two legal reasons on why stablecoins, um, there are economic reasons for sure, but legal reasons why stablecoins did not happen in the EU. One thing is e-money, uh, that's, that's obvious. The other one is um, AML, because it's not obvious in many countries if you can actually issue a stablecoin and send it without complying with AML. Um, and, you know, it's not a given that those favorable interpretations in the U.S. right now with, um, you know, FinCEN interpreting, you know, like just giving very favorable interpretation to decentralized finance and to the fact that non-custodial wallets and transactions between them are not subject to ML, I think that this is at risk. This is always at risk, at risk and we can just wake up in a reality in which all of those transactions are subject to ML. Um, and this is the first problem we should try to tackle. And, and just to... Just a last last point to answer. The from the technical uh, uh, solution, they they just said it. But for the uh, law uh, point of view and uh, political power, uh, AML and know your customer is uh, considered too serious to be uh, at a level of uh, only one country or a continent. So it cannot be like just Europe or just the U US. It's more like a transact transatlantic uh, and uh, G20 uh, FATF uh, topic than anywhere uh, else. So it's only G20 and FATF. So I think we're done. Yeah, thanks, guys. <laughs> now we're going to break for just shy of 10 minutes and reconvene at 4.15 uh, for a fireside chat with Stani from Ave.